We've talked before in the class about aggravating circumstances and about those being the reasons to give the death penalty. Uh, we saw that the mandatory death penalty statutes were struck down uh, because there was no consideration of the individual offender that was taken into account. The Supreme Court in 1976, in the cases that we looked at back at that time, uh, the three that were upheld from Florida, uh, Georgia, and Texas, and the two that were struck down from North Carolina and Louisiana, uh, the fatal problem with the North Carolina and Louisiana statutes were that they did not allow for consideration of the individual person. Uh, the court upheld uh, the Georgia and Florida statutes that provided uh, for mitigating circumstances. Georgia statute just said anything in mitigation. Florida gave a long list of mitigating factors. And then Texas asked three special questions, but the idea was that the, the jury would be able to take into account uh, things about the person uh, when they decided that. Uh, as the court said, uh, the diverse frailties of humankind, this was in Woodson versus North Carolina, uh, was required. Uh, now normally, uh, the scope of sentencing and what can come in at sentencing is decided by legislatures, uh, by statutes. Uh, in non-capital cases, they decide, for example, in the federal system what is going to be taken into account under the sentencing guidelines. Uh, the question that comes before the United States Supreme Court that we're going to talk about today uh, is, now that we know there has to be individualized consideration, uh, how broad is that or how narrow is that? Uh, can the states decide uh, what factors can be considered, as Florida did with its list of uh, mitigating factors? Uh, and we're going to see with the Ohio statute a very clear example uh, of a limit on mitigation and then what the Supreme Court says is a matter of uh, constitutional law in the case of a woman named Sandra Lockett who was involved in a pawn shop robbery uh, in Ohio. Uh, if ever there was a sympathetic case, if a murder case can ever be a sympathetic case to come before the Supreme Court, uh, it was Sandra Lockett's case. Uh, she was 21 years old. Uh, she had no prior record of any serious uh, misconduct, and she and a man named Al Parker, Nathan Earl Drew, and her brother uh, were involved in the robbery of a pawn shop. There was no plan to kill, uh, but once the, uh, the, the people, uh, she's in the car uh, while the others go in to rob the pawnbreaker, uh, pawnbroker, uh, and while in there, uh, the, the fight breaks out and Parker shoots and kills the pawnbroker. So he's the main person here in terms of having uh, committed, the, uh, committed the homicide, uh, but he pleads. Uh, he pleads guilty and testifies against the other people. In exchange for that, he avoids the death penalty. This is your classic uh, plea bargaining uh, in capital cases. Uh, Lockett's brother is tried and sentenced to death, uh, and Dew uh, does not receive the death penalty because it's found that his involvement was primarily the product of a mental deficiency, that his uh, mental limitations uh, excused him from the death penalty. And then Sandra Lockett was sentenced to death. Now let's take a look at the Ohio statute. Uh, and what it provided uh, with regard to uh, how the death penalty was going to be imposed uh, in Ohio. Uh, seven aggravating circumstances. A person, if, if one or more of those is found, then the death penalty is imposed unless the jury finds uh, one of the three mitigating factors. Uh, one of them being that the victim uh, of the offense uh, 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 induced or facilitated uh, the crime. Uh, secondly, that there was duress, coercion, or strong provocation involved. Uh, and finally, and this is the one that applied to Mr. Dew, uh, that the offense was primarily the result of the offender's psychosis or mental deficiency. None of these apply to Sandra Lockett. Uh, she's minimally involved. She's out in the car while the crime takes place in the pawn shop. Uh, she has some other factors uh, that she wants to put forward, which we'll talk about in a moment. But what's Ohio trying to do here? What Ohio is trying to do is follow what the court said in the 1976 cases and limit the consideration of aggravating and mitigating circumstances so that it's the same in every case on the theory that this will mean that the death penalty will be consistently imposed in Ohio. Uh, the problem is it leaves out considerations of some fairly compelling mitigating factors. Uh, what Sandra Lockett wanted the court to hear uh, was about her minor participation in the crime, and not only hear about it, of course they knew that uh, from, the, uh, from the trial, 
Uh, but to take that into account uh, as a mitigating factor, uh, as a reason not to give her the death penalty. Uh, she also had uh, testimony of a psychologist uh, that her prognosis for rehabilitation was good, uh, that also she was in a drug treatment program and she was on the uh, road to recovery. Uh, and uh, these factors could not be taken into account uh, in deciding her sentence. And the judge uh, seems to have some reluctance uh, in imposing the death penalty. Uh, in this case, Chief Justice Berger writes for the court, and he goes through at some length uh, the plea bargaining, uh, the offer that was made to Sandra Lockett two weeks before trial, uh, the offer that was made on the day of trial, and even the offer that was made to her to get a life sentence, to plead guilty and avoid the death penalty after Parker testified at her trial. Now normally, settlement negotiations or plea negotiations have no legal significance whatsoever. Uh, but what Chief Justice Berger is clearly communicating here is that the state really didn't believe uh, that it had to have the death penalty for Sandra Lockett. It was willing to give her a plea bargain, uh, and this is unusual in that all the plea offers are set out in the Supreme Court's opinion, uh, and brings uh, the court to the conclusion uh, in terms of what can be considered. Uh, and uh, Chief Justice Berger, writing for the court, says that the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendment require that the censor, in all but the very rarest cases, is not to be prevented from considering as a mitigating factor any aspect uh, of the life and background and circumstances uh, of the defendant, as well, of course, as the circumstances of crime, but any factors uh, proffered uh, by the defense as a basis for a sentence less than death. Uh, failure to consider this, he says, will run the risk of the death penalty being imposed despite uh, factors that may cause for, a, may be reason for a lesser sentence. Uh, and therefore, that would be arbitrary under the Eighth Amendment that if someone like Sandra Lockett is receiving the death penalty, even though there are factors that call uh, for her uh, to receive a lesser sentence, that violates the Eighth Amendment's uh, protection against cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, well, there's not uh, unanimity with regard to this. Uh, Justice White uh, says this is, we're just going right back to Furman. Uh, we're going back to completely unfettered dis uh, discretion by juries. If they can consider anything uh, and then decide uh, on the death penalty based on anything that's put before them, uh, we're right back to Furman. Interestingly, uh, when we looked at aggravating circumstances, uh, after the Supreme Court decided Zant versus Stevens, the case that said once the jury finds an aggravating factor, it can consider anything and impose whatever punishment it wants. Justice Marshall had said, we've gone back to Furman. So now we have justices on both sides of the court who are saying we're, 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 we're risking now uh, the arbitrary imposition of the death penalty that we found to be unconstitutional in, in Furman uh, versus Georgia. This case could not be more important uh, because uh, what uh, the Supreme Court is saying here is that uh, the defendant, the defense counsel, uh, decides what's going to be admitted uh, in uh, uh, mitigation in a, in a case. In other words, the state can't decide that these three mitigating factors, like Ohio did, are the only three things to be account taken into account. Or that the long list that Florida had, which was a much uh, more, many more mitigating factors, uh, it, it has to be not only those, but anything that the defense proffers as a basis for a sentence less than death. And as the death penalty develops after the Lockett case, uh, these uh, become critical in terms of what evidence is going to be admitted at the penalty phase uh, of capital case. Um, we see this applied again in the case of uh, Eddings versus Oklahoma. This is a 16-year-old youth uh, who was um, uh, convicted and sentenced to death in Oklahoma for the murder of a state patrolman. Uh, he had three aggravating factors, heinous, atrocious, and cruel, avoiding arrest, and future dangerousness. Uh, the trial judge admitted evidence uh, of his troubled youth, the fact that his parents divorced when he was just five years old, uh, that his mother was an alcoholic, probably a prostitute, uh, that he was not supervised, and that he was excessively punished by his father. All this evidence comes in, but the judge, and this was a sentencing not by a jury, but by a judge, the judge says that he cannot take into account uh, the facts of Eddings' violent background. Uh, Supreme Court decides uh, that that violates um, Lockett versus Ohio. Uh, 
Chief Justice Berger, who wrote Lockett, now departs company with the court and says, wait a minute, uh, uh, this is just semantics. Uh, the judge uh, received all the evidence. Uh, and this, uh, what he said, uh, shouldn't be a basis for setting aside. But the majority of the court said, you've got to not only admit the mitigating evidence, but it has to be considered. It has to be a part of the weighing process, which is what Oklahoma had. Uh, it has to be part of the weighing process in deciding uh, whether or not to give the death penalty. In Hitchcock versus Duggar, the Supreme Court, in one of the rare times in all of its death penalty cases, is unanimous, nine to nothing, uh, with Justice Scalia writing for the court and striking down a jury instruction in Florida that limited the mitigating circumstances uh, to just the mitigating, to those set out in the statute. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to see uh, that this uh, does not last long. Uh, that Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas are going to part company uh, with this, but at least at this one time. Uh, 1987, when Hitchcock was decided, this was the one place where the court was in complete agreement that anything about the life and background of the person uh, should be considered. What about the Texas statute, though? Uh, we recall that we, when we looked at that, when we talked about aggravating circumstances, uh, Texas has these three special questions. Uh, was it deliberate? Uh, is the person a future danger, a probability that there'll be a future danger? Uh, and was there provocation? Uh, how is mitigating or how are mitigating factors considered in the Texas uh, scheme of things? Uh, the Supreme Court had rejected a challenge uh, in a case, Franklin versus Lenaw, uh, in which he had wanted to put on or said his evidence in mitigation, which was his good behavior in prison. Uh, could not be considered under these three questions. Uh, but the Supreme Court said actually it could be considered uh, under the questions and therefore, uh, because when you're looking at future dangerousness, one thing you could ask in looking at that is, has the person uh, adjusted well uh, to prison or jail uh, in the past? Uh, so that was rejected. But a very different case is presented by John Paul Penry. Uh, his mitigating factor is uh, his intellectual disability or at the time referred to in the Supreme Court case as mental retardation. Uh, and he says that under the three uh, Texas questions, uh, this cannot uh, be considered. Uh, Justice O'Connor accepts that argument for the court and says that evidence of intellectual disability is relevant to moral culpability uh, so that the jury can express what she often says in her cases, a reasoned moral response uh, to uh, the crime and the defendant that are before it. Uh, and she points out that this uh, evidence of intellectual disability could not be considered under the uh, three questions that Texas has. Uh, it's not appropriate for deliberateness. Uh, it doesn't go to future dangerousness. She points out it, goes, it cuts both ways uh, because a person who is intellectually disabled uh, may not learn from their mistakes, may not plan, and therefore uh, may be a future danger or it could be used by a jury uh, to conclude that they're a future danger. And of course, it doesn't go to provocation, uh, the, the, the last question that's asked. Uh, here we see the court starting to, to disagree about this. Justice Scalia uh, writes a dissenting opinion. He's joined by Justice Rehnquist, White, and Kennedy. So this is a five uh, to four opinion. He says, uh, Texas has done a perfectly fine job guiding the discretion of the jury with the three questions, and we should leave it alone. Uh, the Supreme Court has uh, no uh, business uh, telling Texas how it is to consider uh, mitigating factors. As Justice Scalia puts it somewhat colorfully, uh, this puts all sympathetic factors are just to be dumped before the jury uh, for an outpouring of personal reaction. And of course, what he's saying there is this is going to be arbitrary too. So the argument is, one, if you don't consider the individual circumstances, it will be arbitrary. Uh, but if you do allow anything to be taken into account in mitigation, it, the death penalty is going to be imposed uh, arbitrarily. Uh, in two cases that came not long after that, 1990, Walton versus Arizona, and 1993, Graham versus Collins, uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas reject uh, the Woodson Lockett line of cases. That is, the cases that say that anything offered as a basis for a sentence less than death has to be admitted in mitigation. Uh, Justice Scalia uh, says in Walton that there's an inherent tension uh, between the requirements of aggregation, 
limiting aggravating circumstances and having unlimited mitigating circumstances. Uh, and that these contradictory commands uh, does not constrain the discretion of the jury in the way that it should be. Uh, and so his question, and this is what I raised earlier, whether society uh, may specify what factors uh, are going to be uh, taken into account in sentencing or not. In other words, could the state legislature decide, as Ohio did, these are the only three mitigating factors, or as Florida did, these are the mitigating factors uh, that we're going to allow. Uh, as a result, uh, he decides that he will no longer follow uh, the Woodson Lockett line of cases. And so from now on, Justice Scalia dissents from any case involving uh, consideration of mitigating circumstances where the court says there was an unconstitutional limitation on that. Um, the, uh, Justice Thomas, basically the same thing in Graham versus Collins, he takes a different approach, says Furman was a case about racial discrimination, uh, points out that the power to be lenient is also uh, the power uh, to uh, discriminate uh, and says that the states should be allowed uh, to uh, limit consideration of mitigating factors. In fact, in his opinion, Justice Thomas um, in Graham versus Collins makes it pretty clear that he does not have any problem uh, with the mandatory death penalty statutes. Uh, that saying that some crimes are so bad that they always should be punished with death, uh, as far as he's concerned, does not violate anything uh, in the Eighth Amendment. Um, Justice Stevens responds, uh, to both opinions, uh, and he says uh, four things. First, the death penalty is not allowed for certain offenses, uh, that a number of uh, rape, uh, other uh, non-homicide cases are no longer even considered uh, eligible for the death penalty, kidnapping, armed robbery, other, other crimes like that. Uh, secondly, the aggravating circumstances narrow the class of people who can be considered for the death penalty. And that this is what the Eighth Amendment requires, to narrow the class of people who are eligible. Uh, he also says the vague and overbroad aggravating circumstances um, uh, are, are not allowed. Actually, uh, as, as we discussed when we talked about uh, aggravating factors, uh, the courts have said that those catch-all aggravating circumstances like heinous, atrocious, and cruel uh, can be considered as long as the state Supreme Court gives them a limiting instruction. Uh, so whether that's as great a protection as, 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 as he says in the opinion uh, is, is questionable. Uh, and, and finally, uh, that the consideration of whatever is offered as a basis for a sentence less than death, this consideration of mitigating circumstances actually further narrows the class because things like abuse, mental illness, in this case, uh, intellectual uh, disability, those are factors that may call for a sentence less than death and do call for a sentence less than death in some cases, uh, such as Penry. And so once the death penalty has been narrowed uh, by the first three, then the jury can consider in mitigation uh, anything uh, in, in order to decide uh, the ultimate question of, of life and death. Um, Finally, I want to take a look at uh, Tenard versus uh, Dretke. This was a case in which the uh, courts of both Texas and the United States uh, Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit had limited mitigating factors. One limitation they had put on it was to say that mitigating factors had to be uniquely severe. These were a number of cases that came back after the Penry decision in which Texas had to decide um, whether or not the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals and ultimately the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit had to decide whether uh, Tenard and others were entitled to new sentencing hearings because evidence of their mental limitations or intellectual disability was not admitted. Uh, both courts, uh, Texas Court of Criminal Appeals uh, said, we find no evidence that uh, Tenard is uh, mentally retarded, so therefore there's no constitutional violation in his case. Uh, the United States Court of Appeals of the Fifth Circuit said this was not a uh, uniquely severe and permanent handicap uh, which burdened the defendant through no fault of his own and therefore there was no problem. Uh, the other uh, limitation uh, was the notion that there had to be a nexus between the mitigating factor and the crime. In other words, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals said that no evidence uh, that his low IQ in Tenard's case, prevented him from appreciating the wrongfulness of his conduct uh, and kept him from uh, controlling his impulses when this crime took place. 
Uh, and again, the Fifth Circuit said when it looked at the case, uh, there was no evidence that showed that the crime uh, was attributable uh, to his uh, low IQ. Uh, Supreme Court rejects that, uh, si uh, six to three, uh, with Justice O'Connor writing uh, for a majority of the court. She's joined by Stevens, Kennedy, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. And she said these tests that the court in Texas had applied and that the federal court had applied had no basis, no foundation in the decisions of the Supreme Court. Uh, that there's no screening that's done by a judge or by a court uh, before evidence of mitigation is offered to see if it's uniquely severe or if there's a nexus between it uh, and the, uh, the crime that was committed. Uh, the, she repeats that uh, mitigation has been very broadly defined, says that a low uh, IQ is inherently mitigating, even if it doesn't amount to uh, mental retardation, which would preclude the death penalty, it may still be a compelling mitigating factor if the person has limited intellectual functioning. Uh, she says the court has spoken in the most expansive terms uh, in defining mitigation. That relevant mitigation is evidence which tends to prove some fact or circumstance which uh, would be, uh, which a fact finder, that is the jury, uh, would find to have mitigating value. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, Scalia and Thomas dissent, uh, but this is basically uh, the uh, uh, state of the law today. Uh, that the, uh, this prevailing view that uh, anything offered in the about the life and background of the defendant that's seen as a basis for a sentence less than death can be considered in, mitigating, in mitigation. Uh, we will talk uh, next with Susan Marcus who has done a lot of work both in investigating and finding mitigating circumstances and also as a lawyer in presenting it to juries.